Welcome to Bible Believers Fellowship and part two of a two-part message presented by teaching elder Michael Kaler titled Jesus the God-Man. This is part of his series on the Christian fundamentals which are available on Brother Mike's website at 2 Timothy 2-15.org. We will give that address again at the conclusion, but now let's go to part two of Jesus the God-Man. I uh, want to look at um, Hebrews 9.22. And we, we know that um, being born with the blood of God made the payment for sin acceptable to God. The corrupted blood that we had as men couldn't pay the price, otherwise it would have been paid for a long time ago. Way before Jesus came on the scene. Hebrews 9.22 says, and almost all things are by the law purged with blood. And without shedding of blood is no remission. Without the shedding of blood, there is no remission of sin. That sin is not done away with unless there is a blood sacrifice. Jesus had to be both God and man to accomplish it. He had to come as a man, but he also had that, that, that blood of God in order to pay for the sin. Let's look at Isaiah 7.14. And this is speaking of uh, Jesus, the man, having to be born into this world. The Messiah having to be born. Isaiah 7.14 uh, is a prophecy concerning that, um, about the um, coming of this Messiah, how he's going to come into this world. Let's uh, read that together there. Therefore the Lord himself shall give you a sign. Behold, a virgin shall conceive and bear a son, and shall call his name Emmanuel. Now this, um, this is one of these points here that just seems to shake the faith of all these scholars out here. Mm -hmm. How in the world do you have some virgin giving birth to a baby? They can't figure it out. It must not be true. <laughs> there must have been a misprint in there. We've got to go for this other Hebrew translation or something there. This was a, uh, it was a sign that was, that was given to Israel. Uh, anything that was uh, prophesied by, by God to Israel required a sign for confirmation. God established that all the way back in the, you know, the it was Abrahamic covenant. That is, there was always going to be a sign given along with anything that was spoken by him right. to make sure that what he was saying was not only true, but that you would recognize that what, he's, what was being said was really of him. To the, Jew. to the Jew. That's right. We seek after wisdom, so they say. <laughs> to the first. How can this happen? I just say the simple answer is because God is able to do all things. Amen. Amen. I mean, I don't have to go any further than that. There, you, know, you, you start with this idea that even though I don't understand it with my, my I call it my pea brain, <laughs> pea-sized brain here that I can't understand how this can be, doesn't nullify the fact that it's true. That's right. It just means I don't understand what God's able to do. Mm -hmm. Now, we start with the idea that we just believe what God says. God's going to bring this stuff out to us. And as we start to study his word, He's going to show those things how it's more and more possible as you go along. Mm -hmm. Now, I think that a lot of the things we won't have a real true understanding of until we're there with them. That's right. When we get out of this corrupted body of flesh here, which is our brain as part of that corrupted flesh, mm -hmm. we can't understand what's going on a lot of times because these things are spiritually discerned. We will then. We don't quite get it now. And I, I still can't explain how. To, I mean, I, I hear how... Uh, Eggs or the, the, the ovum is fertilized, you know, they'll, they'll take the sperm of the man, put it into the uh, egg and stuff like that there and do it artificially. But that's not what happened here either. That's not here, happened here either there. So what's this word Emmanuel mean? God with us. More, I don't know how you do it. <laughs> <laughs> Let's look at Matthew uh, chapter 1, uh, verses 22 through 23. And Martha's absolutely right there. It, uh, it is God with us. We'll see that. But scripture bears it out. So let's see what Martha said was actually true. That's a, <laughs> we're going to test what Martha just said here. <laughs> let's read that together. Now all things were done that it might be fulfilled, which was spoken of the Lord by the prophet, saying, Behold, a virgin shall be with child, and shall bring forth a son, and they shall call his name Emmanuel which being interpreted it is God with us. She was right. Okay, we don't have to stone Martha. 
God with us. It doesn't say man with us. It says God with us. We have a, 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 a man, if you will, a boy being born into this world, a baby male being born into this world. But his name is God with us. And that was prophesied by God himself back in Isaiah. This is a reiteration once again. They're, they're, they were taking what was already said in the scripture and showing how it was being fulfilled in the here and now. Their here and now. It's already been fulfilled for us a long time later. But we can look at this and say, okay, I know this is really him. And they're reminding us that it's really him because of what scripture had already said. I think what well, scripture is wonderful. If you can't see the connections and things, you need to start reading your Bible more often. Your King James Bible more often. Take all these other ones and throw them out. Burn them so nobody else can get their hands on them. Yeah. Now, nobody should have to read this trash that comes out these days here. Bring forth a son. It's man. God with us. That's God. Man, God. God, man. It's starting to make even just a little bit more sense now that Jesus is 100% man, 100% God. We can only get this through Scripture, folks. We try to understand that idea without looking at Scripture. We just can't get it. But as we go through Scripture, it starts to make a little bit more sense as we go through it. We can also read a, a couple of verses just before that. I want to read verses 20 and 21 here also. Uh, this is where uh, Joseph is, um, well, he's, he's thinking about having to put away his wife, his, his betrothed uh, Mary because she's pregnant. And they hadn't actually been married yet in, in the sense of being married like that. Uh, they were promised in being married, you know, it's like, that's what, you know, being betrothed means that you know, Mary is gonna be your wife, but she wasn't actually his, his wife in the true sense of the word at that point yet, but now she, all of a sudden she's pregnant. I, I can't, as a man believing in God, have a, a woman that's with me that's pregnant and we're not married. That's not acceptable back then. It shouldn't be acceptable now. It is acceptable now, but hey, two guys can get married now and it's acceptable. <laughs> That's how far we've gone, huh? Boy, we're really improving, aren't we? <laughs> what a world. Let's read uh, verses 20 through 21 here. But while he thought on these things, behold, the angel of the Lord appeared unto him in a dream, saying, Joseph, thou son of David, fear not to take unto thee Mary thy wife, for that which is conceived in her is of the Holy Ghost. And she shall bring forth a son, and thou shalt call his name Jesus, for that he shall save his people from their sins. This shows that Jesus is the Messiah. He was the one that was promised that was going to come to save the world, save his people first, then the rest of the world, from their sins. That same seed that was promised all the way back in Genesis 3.15. And you can go and you can look through scripture from that point on and you keep seeing the references like we saw in Numbers and Isaiah. All throughout the old scripture you see uh, Micah. Um, you see these scriptures or these prophecies proclaiming the birth of Messiah, a promised one, an anointed one that was going to save their pe his people from their sins. Yeah, and you know what's interesting too is that we um, we see here that uh, uh, Joseph he calls thou son of David, yeah. and that's an important point here too because uh, he had to be through that line like that. And we know Mary is too, because we trace her lineage back. Mm -hmm. But David is also; he would have been heir to that throne. He could have at any point actually been king over Israel because of the fact that Joseph was not his biological father, but his I guess, stepfather, if you will. Jesus had the same right to the throne as a result of that. Not because of Mary coming through David, but because of Joseph coming through David. That gave him legal access to the throne. Mm -hmm. He could have been king at any point at that time. And he will be. Mm -hmm. He will be a king of Israel at some point here. King over the whole of the earth. <laughs> you know, when, when he says to do something, you do it or you get struck with drought. <laughs> <laughs> Now also there are a lot of references to Jesus as the Son of Man and the Son of God in Scripture. And uh, Mark 1.1 1, 1, uh, starts off that way, the beginning of the Gospel of Jesus Christ, the Son of God. 
Jesus Christ, man, his gospel, and mentioned as the Son of God. Unclean spirits recognize Jesus as the man. Oh, yeah. man. Well, they recognize the man, Jesus, as God. Mark chapter 3 and verses 11 through 12. Uh, go ahead and read that together. And unclean spirits, when they saw him, fell down before him and cried, saying, Thou art the Son of God. And he straightly charged them that they should not make him known. It wasn't time for that message to go out yet. He told them to keep that quiet, not to make that known. But they recognized him. These are unclean spirits. I, we see them as devils, demons, whatever you may want to call it. He calls them unclean spirits, which is the way I like to go with it, because that's what the Bible says. Yeah. <laughs> if I say it some other way, I may be messing something up that I don't realize. So I'm going to stick with what he says here. Unclean spirits recognized him, fell down before him, and worshipped him. Called him Thou art, said that thou, thou art the Son of God. There's another one. The man with the unclean spirit named Legion uh, knew who Jesus was. And we went through that message here a while back too here. Uh, we were going through Mark. Mark 5, 7 says, And he cried with a loud voice and said, What have I to do with thee, Jesus, thou Son of the Most High God? I adjure thee by God that thou torment me not. He wasn't going to torment him yet. It wasn't their time. That torment's going to be perfect when it does happen. It's going to be forever. They're going to be right down there in the lake of fire along with every single unbeliever. But this is saying, what do I have to do with thee, Jesus? He's seeing the man, Jesus, and addressing him as God. Son of the Most High God. Once again, our Bible has it correct because they capitalize that S there. Mark 15, verse 39. Now, we'll go ahead and read that together too. And when the centurion, which stood over against him, saw that he so cried out and gave up the ghost, he said, Truly this man was the Son of God. Once again, a Roman centurion recognized this man as God. This, this man Jesus calling him the Son of God. And once again, that has been capitalized. Now what I think is so amazing is that we have um, Gentiles. We had unclean spirits recognizing Jesus as God. His own people that he came to save from their sins did not. Specifically those ones that were in charge. They knew who he was, but they weren't going to recognize him that way. Because once again, you're messing up my game. Everybody, you know, recognized him except for the Jews, and specifically those important Jews, if you will. Mm -hmm. um, they do later on, um, as we see here. There are many references that uh, do show Jesus as the Son of Man also. And um, this uh, reference here, this first one, in fact, the first couple, uh, have Jesus referring to himself as the Son of Man. Once again, he had to be both man and God in order to pay the price for our sins. Luke 22 and verse 69 says, Hereafter shall the Son of Man sit on the right hand of the power of God. This is Jesus speaking that. I'm glad that there's a way I can make these characters read because that's what Jesus said. Mm -hmm. You know, in person. And I, I say in person because we have people out here also that want to call themselves red letter Christians. They won't believe anything unless it's said in the red letters here. Uh, if they hear anything else, they won't believe it because it's not in the red letters. It wasn't speaking by Jesus the man that said that there. Uh, Jesus the man, though, said that man shall live by every word that proceedeth out of the mouth of God. Amen. Uh, and that is the word, as we saw right here at the beginning. Jesus is that word. So if you're only paying attention to the red letter parts, you're missing everything else. Mm -hmm. It is all the word. It's all from Jesus. Jesus spoke it all. Amen. He spoke some of them as man here like this, but more importantly, he spoke a lot of them as God. You're held accountable to that. Even if you don't think it's God, you'll still be held accountable to the fact that you chose not to believe it only because you're trying to rationalize how you could get out of having to do these things that God said to do. That you wanted to try some other way 
to be reconciled back to God and in some other way other than what God said is the only way. Mark 2 and 10. But that ye may know that the Son of Man hath power on earth to forgive sins, he saith to the sick of the palsy. Once again, he's referring to himself as the Son of Man. We've seen how he's the Son of God. He's speaking as the Son of Man. Mark uh, chapter 8, verses 27 through 29, uh, speaks of uh, Jesus knowing that he'd be rejected by his own people, as we see here. That's why I say that the Romans knew it, the, the Gentiles knew it. The unclean spirits knew. Even a man possessed with a thousand of them, a legion. We are many, he says, or knew that Jesus is God, his own people. We'll see here. Let's read this together here. And Jesus went out and his disciples into the sound of Caesarea Philippi. And by the way, he, was asked, he asked his disciples, saying unto them, Whom do men say that I am? And they answered, John the Baptist. But some say Elias, and others one of the prophets. And he saith unto them, But whom say ye that I am? And Peter answereth and saith unto him, Thou art the Christ. This is when it was first revealed that Jesus was truly the Messiah. It was revealed to Peter. In fact, Peter was addressed by Jesus saying that he was blessed because the Father had revealed this to him, as we read on in that. Um, but Jesus also told him that uh, in another section coming up here, to keep those things quiet for right now. The disciples at that point would have recognized him as Messiah. I think they were the only ones that recognized him truly as Messiah. If, if the rest of the uh, Jews had recognized him as Messiah, they would have crowned him as their king when he came into the Jerusalem. But instead, Jesus wept over that when he came up to their riding on a donkey which is the way a king would have came in. He wouldn't have came in on a horse because that's an animal of war. He would have came in on the donkey like that. It's the way a king would have came in. And that's the way he came to Jerusalem, and they didn't receive him. They received him not. I want to look at uh, Mark chapter 8, and uh, verses 30 through 31. He told him here in uh, Mark chapter 8, verses 30 through 31, that they had to keep this thing quiet. Uh, let's, let's read this together here. And he charged them that they should tell no man of him. And he began to teach them that the Son of Man must suffer many things and be rejected of the elders and of the chief priests and scribes and be killed and after three days rise again. It wasn't time yet to uh, tell the rest of the group or the people here of what was revealed here to, to, uh, by, by God. That they should tell no man of him as Messiah. But that he would have to, as a son of man, would have to suffer many things. And it says, be rejected of the elders and of the chief priests and scribes. And he spoke it openly. And he's, he's right, he's told them that openly. They knew, he knew, and now they would know, that his own people would reject him. They weren't recognize him as Messiah. Like I said, I think some of them knew just because of the miracles that he performed. But they weren't recognizing him by crowning him as king at that point. And they, as a result, were rejecting him this way here. They would have had to recognize him as Messiah to place him in as king. But we know that wouldn't have happened because that would have messed up with what prophecy tells us in the Old Testament. So everything's playing out the way it's supposed to play out. But it's sad. You know, when they, when you know that things wouldn't have had to happen the way they are right now. In fact, that thousand years could have been over with if he'd have been crowned as king right at that point. That was over a thousand years ago. We could have been with the Lord forever in the new Jerusalem. It's not time yet, though. That time's coming. Now, while Peter and the uh, disciples were to keep quiet about the revelation of Jesus as Christ, um, this changed after he was crucified, buried, and risen from the dead. Uh, they were to go out and to pronounce the gospel boldly, which we see happening, oh, especially by Peter. Man, you read that stuff here, and, and Paul. But Peter, in particular, in Acts, well, I tell you what, if he was around these days, he'd have been assassinated. <laughs> how dare you speak to the rulers of this world like this here, you know, like this, you know, talking about how uh, Jesus, the one that's you crucified, you know, 
condemning the scribes and the Pharisees right there in their face. He was boldly proclaiming this. He wasn't ashamed of, what, of Jesus. Look at Mark uh, chapter 8 and verse 38. Whosoever therefore shall be ashamed of me and of my words in this adulterous and sinful generation, of him also shall the Son of Man be ashamed when he cometh in the glory of his Father with the holy angels. Boy, when he comes back to that second coming, there is going to be some... Well, I better not say it. <laughs> There's going to be a lot to be paid for at that point. There's going to be a lot of action going on at that point there. Um, I do not want the Son of Man, Jesus here, to be ashamed of me. I'll be one of the ones way in the back. I mean, it's going to be him and his angels up here getting ready to do battle. We'll be right behind him coming in like this, along with the disciples, the 12 apostles, coming in here and getting ready to set up the kingdom. But I don't want him to be ashamed of me. That is why I'm going to boldly proclaim the gospel of Jesus Christ. Which is that when you believe that he died on the cross, was risen, buried, and risen three days later, all according to scripture, that you're saved. No other way. I always say no matter what Oprah says or any of these other goofballs out here that think they can come up with some other way other than what Jesus said is the only way. There is no other way. Amen. God said it. That establishes it. Sure. I don't want to be ashamed of, be, be put in shame when he returns. You know, if I'm, if I'm ashamed of him now, I don't even really believe that I will be up with him at the point when he comes back. Mm -hmm. I'll be down here on this earth hopefully surviving. What's going on? Mm -hmm. You know, I, I can't be ashamed of him. I think about what he did for me. Yes. He's God. Mm -hmm. He humbled himself to become a man just so he could pay for the price of the sin that I committed. Mm -hmm. Why am I going to be ashamed of that? I want to brag about the fact that I'm a man here who is full of sin. And he loved me enough anyway to come and die for me. Come on. Amen. Jesus also speaks of himself as the Son of Man after the transfiguration. And it says, as they came down from the mountain, this is Mark 9, 9. And as they came down from the mountain, he charged them that they should tell no man what things they had seen till the Son of Man were risen from the dead. He's given them the instruction here. Don't say anything now, but once I'm risen from the dead, brother, cut loose. Amen. Let everybody know about it. Don't you dare keep your mouth shut when you've got an opportunity Amen. to pro proclaim the gospel. Um, you know, so much of the stuff that we study here is just barely scratching the surface. Uh, we try, you know, we're, we're limited on time a lot of times. And... Um, you know, a lot of people can't take more than 45 minutes to an hour of, of teaching anyway. And that, that's understandable. Um, but I think just what we, the little bit that we've seen here today shows how Jesus is 100% God and 100% man. That it had to be that way in order for our salvation to be true. Yes. It couldn't have happened any other way. He had to come into this world through a woman to make it lawful. And that blood that he had had to be pure. It had to be of God in order for our salvation to be true. Amen. He had to be both. Equally both. Under the law, the blood of animals was required to make atonement for sins. The priest would have to come along and offer up a sacrifice for their sins first to cleanse themselves so that they were able to step in then and, and do the sacrifice for the sins of the people. And that only took care of it temporarily. Mm -hmm. Do you know that every day back in those times that there was a sacrifice going on, it was continuous in the temple. I don't know. You ever think about the blood bath that must have been there like that? All that blood. And all because of man's sin. And this only way that we could atone for it at that point was the plan given to us by God. He said, you have to do it this way. Congratulations, this is what you earned. Uh, we, well, yeah, okay, we repeat this thing from 9.22, Hebrews 9.22. Almost all things are by the law purged with blood, and without shedding of blood is no remission. Without that shedding of blood, there is no remission of sin. 
Scripture tells us the blood of animals does not make a permanent atonement for sin. That's why they had to keep on doing it over and over every single day. Some days, you know, you look at the feasts and stuff like that, there, there was a massive amount of atonement going on there. Oh, you know, it's... Um, Oh my gosh. But in Hebrews 10.4, Paul reminds us, for it is not possible that the blood of bulls and of goats should take away sins. Mm -hmm. It's not possible. That blood wasn't the right blood. It wasn't pure blood of God to pay for that sin. There was sin in that blood. How do you pay for sin with sin? It can't happen. It's not possible. Scripture also tells us what does make atonement for our sin once and for all. Amen. Hebrews chapter 10 and verses 9 through 10. Let's read that together. Then said he, Lo, I come to do thy will, O God. He taketh away the first, that this may establish the second. By the which will we are sanctified through the offering of the body of Jesus Christ once for all. Um, once again, you know, coming up the way I did, there, there was a, a, every time you go to this Mass, that there's this offering of, for the sins of the people. They call themselves priests. What was the job of the priest? To offer up sacrifice. They didn't have any other job but to do that. But we had these guys that call themselves priests now, offering up a sacrifice. But my Bible tells me right here that the body of Christ was offered up once for all. That there does not need to be any other sacrifice after that point. It's finished. Jesus had no sin because his father was God. The blood of Jesus was perfect and therefore able to pay the eternal price, sin, requ eternal price required for sin. He did not have to offer himself up for his own sins because he was without sin. He got to skip step one. He went straight to step two the sins of the people. And we know that because of what we just read in verse 10, Hebrews 10.10, 10, we know this payment was called acceptable by God because it was offered up once for all. It does not have to be, continue to be offered up at all. In fact, to offer it up now is an abomination to God Amen. because you're saying that that blood that Jesus offered up on the cross wasn't good enough. Come on. That's exactly what they're saying. I won't have any part of it. We have sinned against an infant in God, and our own good works cannot save us. We have to count on the offering of Jesus made of himself as payment for our sin. And this was freely given to us. If we look in Ephesians 2, 8 and 9, it tells us that this is a free gift, that we cannot earn salvation. It's given to us freely. It's something that we by no means deserve at all. But God gave it to us anyway. Back to John 3.16. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son that whosoever believeth in him should not perish but have everlasting life. That concludes Brother Michael Kaler's message titled Jesus the God-Man. His series on Christian fundamentals are available by visiting his website at 2timothy2-15.org. That web address again is 2timothy2-15.org. You may write to Brother Mike by sending your letter to Bible Believers Fellowship, P.O. Box 662, Worthington, Ohio, 43085. Again, that address is P.O. Box 662, Worthington, Ohio, 43085. I am Pastor Greg, and on behalf of Mike and the entire Bible Believers Fellowship family here in Worthington, Ohio, we thank you for listening.